All right. So, for the first, well, it's already been 20 minutes into stream, but I, w I wanted to try something different. To start out today's stream, I want to read a little bit of the Bible, specifically Romans, the book immediately after Acts, and the reading order of the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul, and it's, well, it's, it's, it's for the Romans. <laughs> if you couldn't tell that by it being called Romans, then, come on, man. But this book also is known to, for having the Roman road, which is the, kind of the structure and the reasoning behind you coming to faith into Christ, if you're if you do not already believe, or if you are wondering what are the reasons for you to believe in Christ. I, I lost the handout. I had a handout. And it's now gone of the verses in Romans that you're, that is supposed to be for the Roman road. So we're just going to be reading Romans. I think we'll be doing this for the next maybe 15, 20 minutes. It's been on my heart recently to talk more about the bible and chat and stream and hopefully we'll see how it goes so romans chapter one i'm not going to be doing a screaming reading though uh, there is a guy that screamed the entire book of the bible that'll be a different stream entirely that i think i'll do that though not today. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle and singled out for God's good news, which he promised long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Wait, did I? I did. Oops. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh, and who has been declared to, to be the powerful son of God by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. We have received grace and apostleship through him to bring about the obedience of faith among all the nations on behalf of his name, including yourselves who are also who also belong to Jesus Christ by calling. To all who are in Rome, loved by God, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all that you, all of you, because the new of your faith is being reported in all the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit in telling the good news about his son, is my witness that I constantly mention you. Telling the good news about his son is my witness. Wait, I read. I read that line twice. Oopsies. Always asking my prayers that it is, if it is something, somehow in God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to him. For I want very much to see you, so I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that I often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now, in order that I might have a fruitful ministry among you, just as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am obligated both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So I am eager to preach the good news to you all who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believed, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For it is in God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth, since what can be known about God is evident among them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is, his internal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became nonsense, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. 
Therefore, God delivered them over in the cravings of their heart to sexual impurity so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve something created instead of the creator who is praised forever. Amen. That is why God delivered them over to degrading passions. For even their females exchanged natural sexual relations for natural ones. The males, in the same way, also left natural relations with females and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Males committed shameless acts with males and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a worthless mind to do what is morally wrong. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Although they know full well God's just sentence, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. Isn't that crazy? That once you have turned over yourself to the immoral, the decrepit, the deceitful, you applaud those that join in your depravity as well. It is not just a matter of you being sick in mind that you drag yourself down. You drag other people's down as well. You revel in dragging others down. It's very interesting. And I would say it's kind of crazy, but I see it happen all the time online. So it's one of those things that when we look at how discourse happens with different ideas and ideologies people ascribe to certain things and believe certain things and once you fall into a evil or unjust mindset you will want to drag others with you not purely because you want others to see the same way you do but because of the draw of sin of evil in the world of disparity Therefore, any one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same. We know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on the truth. Do you really think any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same, that you'll escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance, but because of your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment is revealed. He will repay each one according to his works. Eternal judgment is revealed. Eternal life. Oopsies. Again, see, I do that a lot. I read the same line, and then I read the same line. always annoy me when I've been reading any sort of text. Go down, read the line, read the same line, skip skip over the line I was supposed to actually be reading. Stop it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I gotta read more. Eternal life to those who are... Pr- who, by persistence in doing so, seek glory, honor, and immortality. By wrath and indignation to those who are self-seeking and disobedient, the truth, who are obeying unrighteousness, affliction, and distress for every human being who does evil, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does what is good, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. There is no favoritism with God. All those who sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all those who sinned under the law will be judged by the law. By the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be declared righteous. So when Gentiles who do not have the law instinctively do what the law demands, they are 
a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their consciousness confirms this. Their compelling thoughts will either accuse or excuse them. On the day when God judges what people have kept secret, according to my gospel through Christ Jesus. Dude, this Eldering gameplay is fire. I mean, it's absolutely spectacular. My favorite part is when Margaret comes out of nowhere and hits me with a hammer over the head. But this section right here, 12, verses 12 to 16. There, it's some of my favorite verses in the Bible. Yo, DVN, what's up, dude? W's indeed. Verse 14. So when Gentiles, who do not have the law, instinctively do what the law demands, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. I think I'm going to... Did that just bombard you guys with the sound of the 3 trillion megahertz audio? Because my desktop audio bar just went into peak red. What I do is flick through all the pages, land on a page, and that's my motto for the day. Interesting methodology. I like it. I know some people... But I, well, I guess I should say, be careful because there, there are some times where you can just be flicking through and then you get a weird one. But it's not necessarily a bad idea for a motto. Something I guess I, I could myself do is, and something I want to work on is in my prayer, I am trying to work on when I pray and I'm talking to God that I make a more conscious effort to seek out his will and his desire for my life. And part of that is through reading the scripture. So like when I'm praying, if I'm if I'm praying, I'm like, okay, God, so-and-so is annoying me or I, I would need advice for this person. What is the, oh, something you want me to do? What is the biblical answer to this and what you can do with that is then go read the scripture and see what God puts onto your heart when you read and I know for myself that's something I want to start doing more of I want to start doing more of starting out my day in prayer starting out my day in scripture and helping that lead me throughout my day so I like that a lot DVN and going back to my original thought uh reason for this verse verse 14 and 15 people who are not even believers can have god's truth written on their hearts their conscience which is created by god everything about them is handcrafted by god and it will lead them in some ways to the correct path but obviously we are in a sinful world. We are in a fleshly world. So there's going to be conflicts. There is going to be drag. It is going to fight you so that you do not do what is right. It says, verse 15 says, they show what the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their conscience confirms this. Their comp competing thoughts will either accuse or excuse them. They will either, either excuse themselves of the wrong that they're doing, or they will accuse themselves of the wrong they're doing. And in, it, and in that, it leads a way for God to come in and speak to them and give them the answer to what is accusing them, to say the least. Now, if you call yourself a Jew and rest in the law, boast in God, know his will, and approve the things that are superior, being instructed from the law, and if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor of the ignorant, a teacher of the immature, having the full expression of knowledge and truth in the law, you then, who teach another, don't you teach yourselves, you who preach, 
you must not steal. Do you steal? You say, you must not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who detest idols, do you rob your temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Okay, yeah, it's a little tough, little tough. <laughs> It's also calling out, again, the hypocrisy of the religious leaders and the Pharisees of that day in the temple amongst the Jews. Directly going against what is written in the law, but in knowing the law, they have still chosen to ignore parts and ignore the biggest part, which is Jesus Christ being the... Messiah sent from God. For circumcision benefits you if you observe the law. But if you are a lawbreaker, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the law's requirements, will his uncircumcision not be counted as circumcision? A man who is physically uncircumcised, but who fulfills the law, will judge you who are a lawbreaker in spite of having the law of the letter oh oops the letter of the law and circumcision for a person is not a jew who is outwardly and truly circumcision what and, oh and true circumcision is not something visible in the flesh on the contrary a person is a jew who is one inwardly and circumcision is of the heart by the spirit not the letter that man's praise is not from man but from god You know, you know one prayer, and it's in Irish. Is it the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day as... Oh, my goodness. Wait. Oh, what the... Did I forget the Lord's Prayer? See, now, local Christian streamer forgets the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive those. Oh, and forgive us of trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from other. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. It's the Our Father. Do I know that? Chat. Well, chat is English only because that's the only language I understand. So you can sp you can talk in other languages. I just won't understand it. So feel free to type it out. So what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? Considerable in every way. First, they were entrusted with the spoken words of God. What then? If some do not, did not believe, will their unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? Absolutely not. God must be true, even if everybody is a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and triumph when you judge. But if our unrighteousness highlights God's, un God's righteousness, what are we to say? I use a human argument. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? Absolutely not. Otherwise, how will God judge the world? But if by my lie, God's truth is amplified to his glory, why am I also still judged as a singer? Sinner. <laughs> as a singer. <laughs> and why not say, just as some people slanderously claim, we say, let us do what is evil so the may, may come, the good may come, their condemnation is deserved. See, this is what I like about a lot of the Bible, is when you when you start to read it and look at it, there's so much philosophical debate amongst it, especially amongst the letters of the New Testament. That when you look at it from a 
human perspective doesn't necessarily make too much sense and there's a lot of discourse back and forth about a lot of these things because if we do not believe God is the truth and the way, the life, then what is the reasoning behind these things? The big example is laws. Why do we have laws? A lot of laws were laid out and kind of started by the Ten Commandments, the basis, at least, for a lot of them were based off of the Ten Commandments. But people can argue that the Ten Commandments are just, it's the right thing. But then that goes back to the verse in the previous chapter. It's the right thing to not kill someone, to not steal, to not lie. That's the inherent truth that a Gentile sees. Congratulations! Congratulations! You exist! Congratulations! You exist! This has been a real real moment moment that you are not a part part of. I don't know why you do not exist plays twice. Wait, hold up one second. We're just trying to get my attention. It's an immobile thought, man. It's hard to think sometimes. My brain don't work too good. All right. What is this verse? Or what is this prayer? Ar nefer atar ar namin neofa adia namin thigdu rock go nidifar du thoil ar talhum mara ata ar nihim tab hair. Duin unin ar nara lutha lul agul maith duin guar pikal mar a maheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheheh
It was this well a few weeks ago. Ale is disgusting. It's like putrid, dude. Oh my goodness. I don't understand how anybody likes that. Like, no. It's absolutely disgusting, and I wasted money on it. But, oh well. You live and learn. I now know that alcohol, for the most part, is just doesn't taste good. Except for Moonshine. Moonshine's okay. But, yeah, let's play some Elden Ring. <laughs> 